1972, Ralph Baer released the Magnavox Odyssey. The Odyssey was based on the power of imagination. It had two little dots you moved around with knobs. The games would be overhead sheets you would put over your TV to represent the color that wasn't able to be produced at the time. If you wanted to play a maze game, you would put the maze transparent film over your TV and try to keep the dot in the maze. However, you could cheat the maze game by, of course, just taking the dot out of the maze. Nothing was really stopping you. It was just an overlay over the TV screen. Back then, people didn't have much. It is also known to few people that the Magnavox was the first game to ever make a light gun game. You would shoot the dots, obviously, with a very lifelike rifle that you would have to buy separately. Of course, the lifelike rifles of nowadays wouldn't even be allowed due to kids thinking it's a real gun or whatnot. Players could cheat also by shooting any light source, like a light bulb, and they would win. However, cheating was pointless because there was no score to be kept. In fact, the Magnavox Odyssey kept no score at all. The Magnavox Odyssey was indeed the first video game system, but some of the games were kind of unnecessary. There's one game where there's roulette, and everything is real. You have chips, you have the board, but every, and the dice, except the wheel. The wheel is the overlay that goes on the TV. And how would you, how do you uh, roll the wheel? It is made by randomly turning the knobs and seeing what, uh, what dot the number is on. In my opinion, this is rather pointless. There's another one that was a complicated football game and things like that that is kind of hard to understand. And there's another game that talks about pointing to states and things like that. It was just pretty much... The Odyssey was used as an assistance for some other, you know, board games. Even though the Odyssey was the first video game system ever produced, many rumors are going around that hindered sales greatly. One of the rumors was that since the Magnavox Odyssey was a Magnavox product, the consumers believed that it would only work on Magnavox televisions. This was not true. The same rumor was also spreading around that the Magnavox light gun was also not would also be uh, not functional for any TV that was not a Magnavox brand. Then in 1976, Coleco jumped onto the video game bandwagon and released the Coleco Telestar. The Telestar was a series of video game consoles, and was about 14 of them were made. They varied from the Telestar, which just had you know. Pong uh, variants like, you know, tennis, uh, hockey, and just like Pong, uh, there was a classic, the Alpha, the Color Matic, uh, the Color Tron, and later on they had cartridge based ones that weren't built in, like the Telestar Arcade that had a gun on the side, a steering wheel, and controls in the front. Then the company Fairchild in 1976 released the Fairchild Channel F also known as the Video Entertainment System, or VES. The Fairchild also had a very strange but unique controller. It had like a grip on it, and you can turn it left and right, and you can push the button down, and you can also move the knob like a joystick. The Fairchild also was able to display eight colors at the same time. The release of the Fairchild actually concerned Atari, and they wanted to get their latest project, codenamed Stella, into the market the video game market was filled with other competitors that had cartridge-based systems. Then, in 1976, Magnavox was bought out by Philips, and Philips released their own offshoots of the Odyssey, known as the Philips Odyssey series. There was many units, there was the Odyssey 200, the 2001, and the 2100. They had built-in games, and they were not cartridge-based. Then in 1972, Atari released the smashing hit game known as Pong. It was released as an arcade cabinet and through home, through Sears. The home version had knobs you could switch that would change the game type. It would make it like hockey or uh, tennis, but either way, the Pong game, the element of Pong still remained the same. It just changed the color and things like that. Then, RCA released the RCA Studio 2. And, wow, it was a piece of obsolete shit. 
one, it had design flaws, like the Fairchild System F, and even the Magnavox Odyssey had controllers with cords on them. No, the RCA Studio 2 was on the console itself. Imagine playing a game and you have to be right in front of the console on a keypad. Better, better uh, be ready to get close to whoever you're playing with they want, if you want to torture them as well. Another reason why the RCA Studio 2 was a really big failure is because it was obsolete for the time. The Fairchild already had color and the RCA Studio 2 had black and white graphics. And plus, it was another Pong clone. It just really, it just didn't do well. The reason why for this quick failure and attempted cash-in was because Ralph Baer, the creator of the Magnavox Odyssey, actually wanted to have RCA help him make a video game system. But they said no, so he went to Magnavox and did it. So after that, RCA is just standing there watching Ralph Bear making all the money and they're like, wow, we should have done something. Hey, let's make our own video game console. And they should just stay making electronics. And no games, or video games for that matter. With successes like the Odyssey and the Fairchild that contributed to the development of premature video game consoles, something big was on its way. Very big. So big that it would change the video game world forever. Atari was just about to release Project Stella.